Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my video for the Witcher Blood Origin ending and how it ties in with The Witcher Season 3. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos and careful for spoilers from the series if you haven't seen it yet. The big surprise is the series takes place before even all the earliest lore and history that we know from the books and from the video games. Most of what we know goes back about a thousand years to the first conjunction of the spheres. This took place even before that because the conjunction of the spheres doesn't happen until like the very end of the series. It's basically meant to tell you the origin of Ciri's Elder Blood, the origin of the Wild Hunt, Aridin, and the origin of the White Frost seeming villain, like the ultimate villain of the Witcher universe. But it does seem like they change a few things and invoke a lot of time travel to set up further stuff on like the Witcher season four or however they're going to end the series. That's where we get into a couple additions to the lore. Like there are a couple retcons that they introduced during the series that seemingly contradict some of the lore that we already know about that part of the Witcher timeline. So I'll try to explain where that fits in and why I think they added some of that stuff. During the series, we meet the seven, quote unquote, which are a group of elves that lead to the conjunction of the spheres, the creation of the first proto-witcher, not actually the first witcher, they call it a proto-witcher, I'll explain that, in the beginning of the line that will be the Elder Blood program that eventually culminates in Ciri. During all the Witcher games, all the books, you hear about Ithlane's prophecies about Ciri, about the culmination of the Elder Blood and how she's going to defeat the White Frost. During the Witcher Blood Origin, they give Ithlene a couple prophecies, like they say that this is one of many prophecies she's already had, they've all come true. At the very end, she tells Aile that she's going to be the beginning of the line of Elder Blood that will culminate in Ciri. She also starts talking a lot about time travel, like elves displaced in time, so time travel is going to be a big part of the Witcher TV series. There is some time travel in the books, that'll get into what's happening with Avalak, which you also see in the post credit scene as well too. We see how the Ain Elves went to the other world, like there are two different groups of elves. The original elves on the continent were three different kingdoms that eventually through coup become one kingdom and a bunch get deposited on this other world during the conjunction of the spheres. One of the big additions to the lore is that during the video games, during the books, we actually thought that the other group of elves that Aridin comes from purposefully went to the other world, like they traveled there on purpose. The way they explain this during the series, they accidentally wound up there when the worlds merged during the conjunction of the spheres, so they didn't go there on purpose. They wound up being stranded there. We also found out why the conjunction of the spheres happened too, which I don't believe that they totally get into during the books. The first conjunction was a result of chaos magic interacting with the destruction of the monoliths, like the monoliths amplifying the power of chaos magic, tearing the veil between worlds, between dimensions. That's what stranded everybody on different worlds. That's how humans came to the main world, how monsters came to the main world, and how Aridin and some of the elves wound up on that other arid world. But one of the big things that they introduced earlier in The Witcher Season 2, there's a big flashback that Ciri has where she sees her ancestor, Laura Doran. One of the things they did during the series is they introduced the Ale character who says that she's the first of the line who predates Laura Doran, meaning that Laura Doran would have to be her descendant. So during Ciri's flashback, she sees Laura Doran, she's supposed to be the daughter of Oberon, who is the king that Aridin is serving when he creates the Wild Hunt. So what might be happening in the series is they're just saying that what we see here predates Oberon, eventually he comes along in this other world, Aridin manipulates him, he becomes king of the elves that are stuck on this other world. Eventually Laura Doran is born, and in the canon of the books and the video games, Laura Doran is the beginning of the line of the Elder Blood. They start a program that's going to create a member of their elven race that's so powerful, full of so much magic, that they'll be able to defeat the White Frost. But because of the way they invoke chaos magic during this, like they say chaos magic, they use it a bunch during the series, it sounds like that's a big part of the TV show version of this. In the books, the Elder Blood program is all about defeating the White Frost, and they treat it like this existential, basically world-ending threat, like basically an ice age is going to come to the planet and destroy it. They don't actually try to personify the White Frost as an actual person. But what happens in the books, in the video games, is that we find out that Aridin, through the Wild Hunt, wants to co-opt that, use that power to basically just travel between worlds and become a conqueror of other worlds. They kind of set that up during this because at the end, when Aridin is deposited, when he's stranded on this other world, he finds the skull of the other creature that will become his helmet for the Wild Hunt. And they set up the idea that they were going to use the monoliths to try and steal resources from other planets. So it sounds like he's just going to continue trying to do that through the Wild Hunt. And by present day, he finds out about Ciri's power and her ability to open gates at will and wants to use that so that he can just continue conquering other worlds. I think one of the reasons why they didn't actually use Laura Doran and her father Oberon during the series is because they wanted to show you that Aridin predated them showing up on the other world. Like, 
Airden was behind trying to manipulate them, and this otherworldly female mage character who seemingly was manipulating everyone. That was another big addition to the canon, like I don't remember that from the books or the video games. But like I said, because Ithlene and Avalak both talk about using the monoliths to time travel, people being lost in time, so to speak, I think that this otherworldly woman who's manipulating Baylor and seemingly kind of sets off the entire plot here, leading to the conjunction of the spheres and what happens with Siri later in the timeline, is actually a time traveler from later in the timeline who's come back in time and basically killed this other arid world. Like it used to be a normal world, but she turned into a being of pure chaos magic but destroyed this other world in the process, and she is meant to represent the actual White Frost. Like, they're personifying the White Frost during the Witcher series, and it'll be this woman. Because there's a scene when Baylor gets his chaos magic later, where you see the world around him, this arrowed world, turn to frozen ice frost all around him. You see the woman's invisible white steps walking up to him. I think that's meant to be a personification of the actual White Frost. So that at the very end of the Witcher series, like season five, like however many seasons they wind up going, instead of Ciri fighting what seems like this giant winter storm, White Frost, she's actually going to be fighting a physical person. And it'll be whoever this woman is. I'll explain in a second. I think there's some clues as to who it might be. The White Frost is inevitable. It will come to freeze the worlds one after the other, eradicating all life. Only I can stop the destruction. But at the very end of the series, Avalak gets the Book of Monoliths and discovers that through the magic, you can use the monoliths to travel across your own world and also time travel. And he travels to the past during the events of The Witcher Season 1 before Ciri had met Geralt. This is him standing in the same place, peeking at her in the same way that Geralt was during The Witcher Season 1. It's meant to be a mirror for The Witcher Season 1, like, oh, we've already seen this scene. During the events of this series, they portray Avalak as being a little more innocent, more naive, like at the beginning of his journey. By the time we get to present day with Ciri and Geralt, he's become a more antagonistic character. He does show up during the games, talking to Geralt and Ciri, but he eventually pursues Ciri towards his own ends as well. So you have to remember a big part of this is that there are like a bunch of different forces on the show that all want Ciri for different reasons. Even though during season three, we're going to meet a couple new villains like Ciri's father, Emperor Amir, kind of surfaces as one of the actual main villains. He's been a villain for a while now, but he didn't actually show up for real until the end of season two. He'll be a much bigger force during season three, but there are other villains on the show. Airden and the Wild Hunt are meant to be bigger villains, more antagonistic than her father, but also this mysterious woman, who sounds like she's going to be the personification of the White Frost, is an even bigger villain than Airden and the Wild Hunt. Then we have Mini Driver's character in Yaskir. They said that they introduced them because they wanted to tie the blood origin to the main series in a bigger way so that people who haven't read the books or played the games kind of understand the link between what was happening 1200 years ago and what's happening in present day. Mini Driver isn't playing a character from the book. She's meant to be part of an order of Shanashi who are a real world Gaelic order or they're based on a real world Gaelic history that were servants of heads of lineages that kept track of important information, which she says during the events of the series. She says that her order travels between worlds, between planes of existence, collecting stories. She tells Jaskier to tell the story of the Seven, hoping that it will inspire and help both Geralt, Ciri, and the elves of the current day of the Witcher. Part of the idea in him learning this story is learning the true origin of Arid and the Wild Hunt, the threat that he represents, but also she wants to inspire the elves of present day who are on the verge of dying out during the events of the Witcher Season 3. After he winds up learning the story, she sends him back to the battle that was happening after the events of Witcher Season 2, but before the events of Witcher Season 3, where the elves were saving him from the Temerians. Here's where we get to that mysterious woman that appears as pure chaos energy who was manipulating Baylor, seemingly setting off the entire events of what take place in the Witcher books, like the entire Witcher universe. This is where we get to like a real big retcon, like this isn't something that I think is going to be from the books or the games, and I think it's them setting up their end game ultimately for the entire series. During The Witcher Season 3, they just cast an actress to play the Falca character, and what they're saying is that she's also part of Ciri's Elder Blood lineage, who came from a little bit after the events that we saw during Blood Origin. She is a character from the lore, she's incredibly antagonistic. But what they might have done is use this time travel twist they introduced through Ithilene's prophecy and through the monoliths and say that she was also stranded earlier in time on this other world and wound up destroying it, turning it into the arrowed world in her bid to become pure chaos energy. Like they tried to foreshadow during the series that Baylor gaining this chaos magic, it comes with a cost. Like this whole world that they traveled to, this arid world, didn't used to be like this. It probably used to be a very lush green world. 
So whoever this person is wound up destroying the planet in a bid to become this powerful. And throughout the series, Baylor keeps telling her, I'll give you anything that you want as long as you help me gain this chaos magic power. So it implies that the woman just wants to consume other worlds. And that's why I'm saying that she's probably going to be the personification of the White Frost that's talked about in the books, like the ultimate main villain of all the Witcher stories. The real big retcon being that in the books, it's not actually personified as an actual person. Like it's just like this existential threat that Siri's trying to stop. More like an actual force of nature. The showrunner did say that the Wild Hunt would be one of the biggest villains on the show in the future, but like I said, that's more aired in trying to do lower level things, and it sounds like this other mysterious woman, Chaos Magic Being, is manipulating him to do that as well. The other big part of the ending is showing you the actual conjunction of the spheres, like the monoliths exploding with all the Chaos Magic energy. The barriers between worlds, planes of existence are broken, allowing the worlds to merge briefly. While they're merging, that's how creatures, humans, elves all get redistributed on all the different planets. We see the first humans get dumped on our main world. They weren't originally from this planet. Airden gets stranded on this other world and finds the skull of the creature that will become his helmet for the wild hunt. The whole idea is that Airden underneath his helmet looks like this. He just uses magic in this really scary looking armor to seem like this otherworldly creature. And we also see monsters continue to get deposited on the world, like they show the monster board. The Easter egg here is that all the monsters that are shown on this board are monsters based on ones from the books. The showrunner said that the flying monster they faced earlier is meant to be their version of a hydra, which is supposed to be based on the same folklore that the books draw from. The way they explain the origin of the witchers is also meant to be a bit of a retcon too, like they try to introduce stuff that happens before the lore that we already know from the books and the games. So the actual order of the witchers is meant to be exclusively human. The reason why I think they're saying that an elf is the first proto-witcher, like why they're introducing all this, is because at this time, like before the conjunction of the spheres, there were no humans on the planet and they wanted to show the origin of witchers. So it's sort of them working in reverse from the problem, like they can't actually show you a real witcher, like a traditional witcher, until humans wind up on the planet. And I think what they're saying is, is that the actual trial of the grasses that Geralt went through, like the other traditional witchers, just wound up being an evolution of this process. Like it wound up being something a little bit different from what you saw during the series. Because a big part of the actual trial of the grasses that Geralt, the other witchers go through that is eventually lost, is the use of elder blood, which Ciri has. Which is why during the Witcher season 2, Vesemir thought that he could use Ciri's blood to recreate the Witcher potions so that their order would not die out. But the basic idea is that after the conjunction of the spheres, you have all these monsters showing up all over the place, killing people. That's when the actual orders of witchers start to rise up, the more traditional ones that you see during present day. And it's in response to all these monsters showing up all over the place. They've already released a bunch of information about season 3, so I will try to do a Witcher season 3 video in the next day or two. I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions just because it was a little bit confusing with the way they explain things. Just in general, I didn't think that the Witcher Blood Origin series was that great. It played a little bit like a video game cutscene. Like it worked okay as a video game cutscene, but as an actual series, it felt like it needed to be like way more episodes. Like there was just too much stuff that they brushed over and too much new stuff they introduced but didn't fully explain. Everyone click here for that new Henry Cavill Warhammer trailer video and click here for my new Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania trailer video. Thank you so much for watching, happy holidays, and I'll see you guys in the next one.